Please welcome founder of Future Stay, Philip Kennard, and member of Restore Homeowners Autonomy and Rights, Marjane Moore Roberts, in discussion with Skipped Executive Editor and Founding Editor, Dennis Shaw. Hey, I'm really glad to have you both here. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having us. Um, before we get to the stars of the, sh of the show, um, I just wanted to ask the audience, how many of you sh stayed in a short-term rental in New York City last night? Hmm, nobody wants to fess up. Okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about Local Law 18. And we're going to get a, a host perspective, which is on that and other issues, which is great. Um, so why don't you both first um, just give us a little intro about who you are, what your organizations are. Sure. I'm Marjane Moore Roberts. I'm a member of ROAR, uh, Restore Homeowner Autonomy and Rights. We're about 550 households of one and two family homeowners across New York City, all five boroughs. Uh, about 50% people of color, uh, you know, 62% or so of us make under the medium income. Uh, we have, um, you know, just a, a variety of people who have been using short-term rental as a means to supplement their monthly income in order to afford their homes. Right. Uh, Philip. I'm Phil Kennard, the founder of Future Stay. Future Stay uh, built the largest property management system in the industry for people that have one property. We like to call those rentalpreneurs, people that are putting their blood, sweat, and tears into short-term rentals in order to build a better life for themselves and make more money. Uh, what we learned by doing that was that most rentalpreneurs don't want a property management system. They want an easy way to make money and not lose their house while they're doing it. Uh, and we help rentalpreneurs succeed. And you're a, you you uh, do some some short-term rentals yourself as well, right? I do. Yeah, I have a couple properties, and I've been a rentalpreneur for the better part of ten years. So local law, law eighteen basically uh, bans short-term rentals in New York City unless you want to have dinner every night with the host and stay in a place that uh, there are no locks on the bedroom doors. Um, it's very cozy, if, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, but it's affordable, um, if that's what you need, right? Um, so what is your take on Local Law 18, and how did it affect your business? Yeah, and I, I think the other one you'd add is you can have no more than two people per unit. So which families is, out, basically. So families are, families are out. Right. You know, listen, our perspective is that, you know, we are not uh, for getting rid of Local Law 18 in its entirety. Okay. We believe in common sense regulation. We definitely saw that there was some gross exploitation of the short-term rental market here in New York City. So we understand and recognize that in some ways it needs and What do you mean by gross exploitation? Well, there are yeah. people doing arbitrage. There were okay. people who took dozens and dozens of units right. off of the rental open rental market, mm -hmm. and that did have a negative impact in, in a lot of ways on sure. buildings. On you know, and, and some people would have you believe it had a negative impact on um, uh, you know the housing crisis, and and you know rents went up. Right. Um, what our position is, is yes, we need some regulation, but for one and two family homeowners, people who offer short-term rental in the homes they live in as a means to make ends meet, the law goes too far. Mm -hmm. um, so our ask is that you know we, we take a fresh look at it and really start to think through the various constituencies. We've heard today from a lot of people, it's a huge market, it's a dynamic market. Um, and you know, there's a lot of money to be made. But um, you know, I'm here today for you know people, you know, the Lopez's in the Bronx, for example, whose kids have all left and they're trying to hold on to the house that they spent 30 years paying for. Right. Or I'm here for you know our member Skip, who is 20 years into a 30-year mortgage and unfortunately is now disabled and was using short-term rental to keep that going. You know, I'm here for the guy in you know the far Rockaways who has to move out of his house uh, now for a couple months in the summer so he can afford the house for the rest of the time. Wow. So um, you know, local law 18 may be necessary. We see value in it in terms of curtailing bad behavior and bad right. actors. But for one and two family homeowners, we think that there's nuance um, that the law should take a look at and, and apply to our cases. Sure. Philip? So, you know, what we see is pretty interesting. So Future Stay enables short-term rental managers and owners, rentalpreneurs specifically, to connect to the core channels that they're used to. We've heard from a number of them today. We're going to see, you know, uh, Airbnb on the stage in a minute after this. Uh, but it also allows them to take bookings directly from their own website. And, you know, there's... The, the short-term rental industry before Airbnb existed and instant bookings were a thing, and when Verbo was request to book or really more of a lead generation platform, 
there was always a match made between a guest and a property owner or host. And so you still see that kind of transaction happening, even in a market that's regulated like New York, right? So, you know, we're supporting rentalpreneurs being able to succeed, even if uh, they're taking bookings in ways that are outside of the major channels. Uh, it, it's, this is a massive challenge, but it's not a challenge that goes unanswered. So I, I was looking for a short-term rental stay in New York City uh, for t tomorrow night. Hello, Craigslist. Right. Um, <laughs> and I found a couple of Facebook groups. But it's really the Wild West, uh, what, which I guess is the intention. Like, you would have to send a deposit to somebody. You, you don't know if they're, they're real. You have no, um, you have, you have no support if, if something goes wrong or you get ripped off. So um, have you seen people using those things? or? You know, listen, what I'll say is that the, the whole housing ecosystem in New York City is quite complex. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. I think our, our elected officials have, you know, a big job ahead of them in terms of figuring out how to solve for that. But the answer is not, um, you know, sh eliminating short-term rentals for, you know, one- and two-family homeowners. When you do something as dramatic as, you know, the regulations that they put in place, people are forced to do things that to take desperate measures in order to hold on to their homes. Right. And I think people, you know, anybody who's in business here understands leverage. You know, most of us are leveraging our biggest asset in order to make sure that we can secure what we have, plan for the future, take care of our families. And so if you take that away and give people the option of either following the law, um, you know, not having housing security for their families, they, some people may choose to go underground. Right. We think that's a mistake because there's all kinds of safety issues involved in that, as you mentioned. You know, at least when you're able to rely on a platform or you rely on the ability to vet people, you have a record of those folks, then, you know, you have a little bit of a safer system. So right. I think people are desperate, and I think this law is uh, as much about housing affordability for homeowners as it is about anything. You know, right. one, one of the problems, and, and this we're gonna get into this I think later on, but the rentalpreneur, people that, like what you're talking about here, Marginet, that have one property, two, three, four, five, they are, these, they're not large companies. These are individuals that are looking to kind of create a way for themselves to build some wealth or just pay off the debts that they have and, and live a better life. They don't have access to technology to do things like automated, automated guest screening. Right, so right. it does become a risk issue. They don't have the same tools that the professional managers have. That's one thing we do at Future State. We make sure that rentalpreneurs have access to those tools. But this is something that one of the big uh, inequities in the industry is that almost all short-term rental supply doesn't have access to the technologies and tools and platforms that you've seen different people come and talk about all day today. Yeah, right. I've been really impressed and excited for a lot of the entrepreneurs that I heard speak today. But, you know, a lot of people, a lot of our members, we, we don't want to be full-time landlords. Right. You know, our ambition is not to have a tech stack and to not, you know, necessarily, you know, aspire down with to... with tech stacks. <laughs> I, I'm not down with tech stacks. <laughs> you know, I have a whole other career that I'd like to live. I, yeah. I'm trying to... You know, I, listen, I, I'll tell you, I spent 15 years saving to buy my house. Right. You know, one of our co-founders uh, of Roar grew up in Section 8 housing right. and moved to New York and was able to save finally. And through, you know, the luck of timing and, you know, thank God I was able to save the money, et cetera, we have a home. And our goal is not, you know, God bless the people who want to build tech stacks. I, I you know, listen, I, I have a healthy respect for it. But there's room in this market for people who just want to use the home they live in, leverage the asset right. that they have in order to make sure they can take care of their family and take care of themselves. And, you know, you as people who are who are doing this work, you can play a role in advocating with us um, for, you know, what well, ultimately is the supply that your business depends on. You know, it, it doesn't service anyone if everyone wins except for the individual homeowners. Right. And in New York City, in our case, you know, we feel like one and two family homeowners, we're, we're losing this battle. And in some cases, people are losing their homes. And, you know, we just need help advocating for that nuance, that carve out. Right. Uh, I think one of you mentioned uh, the other day that there's been um, about loopholes. Yeah. Uh, unintended, co unintended consequences. That's right. Could, could one of you talk about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I mean, you know, the law is a blunt force object. That's one of the quotes we've heard as we've, as we've talked to different people. 
But one of the things that happens with Local Law 18 is there are exceptions for Class B buildings. And as a result of that, um, people who own Piedra Terrace, for example, you know, multi-million dollar condos and apartment residences, right. they're able to continue to do short-term rental right. un unfettered. They have unfettered, uh, uh, unfettered access and mm -hmm. a fast track to all the revenue opportunity that one or two homeowners missed. Right, the door was slammed shut for us, but open for other people. And, and listen, people are taking advantage of that. And you know, we saw, we've seen um, people who you know are promoting new apartments by this apartment. We were able to circumvent local law 18. Oh, wow. You know, on an 11 million dollar apartment. Right. You know, so I'm just asking people to juxtapose that to people who are you know actually really just trying to make ends meet. Right. I mean, there's a different story, and it's the tale of a marketplace that, you know, is exciting and vibrant and lucrative. And, you know, there's room for many different types of players. And, you know, as a business, I think anyone who cares about economic equity, for example, or the impact they have uh, on, on the climate, we heard about that, but there's also impact on uh, the economies for, for people who are trying to stay in the third most expensive city in the world. Um, and probably other places in the country, frankly, I'm sure that's not only the case in New York. There are people who rely on this as a way to take care of their lives and their families. Yeah, this is a really important point, right? I think there's a, you know, sad in all the presentations today, there's a misnomer that keeps happening over and over and over again. We're referring to this as supply. We're calling them assets. These are people's homes, right? And in most cases, they're people's homes where they've worked their entire lives to purchase this. Maybe it's a second home, like in my case. I've still worked a lot, a lot, of, way, a lot, of, a lot of time to purchase that second home, right? These are not businesses. They are individuals that are looking to make a better way of life for themselves. Here's the important point that we miss as an industry. 50% of all short-term rentals are owned and operated by people that have one short-term rental, right? Do we see the slide? I think it's going to illustrate... Uh... Yeah. what you're talking about and globally higher yeah. than that right I right mean. so that's yeah, just one going. yeah and yep. so so just one short-term rental more importantly 95 percent percent of short-term rentals are owned or operated by people that have between one and five rentals almost the entire industry is is what margin is talking about yeah. this isn't the tail it's the long tail mm -hmm. it's almost the entire space and so the challenge that we face as an industry is that you know, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll put this back here on Skift, right? How many hosts with one property have you had on this stage? Not many, and that's why you're here today. Right. <laughs> and, that's, and that's exactly you know? the point, right? So <laughs> this, is really, this is a really important moment for our industry because we're starting to take stock of the fact that almost the entire industry isn't invited to the conversation, mm. which is why things like these policies that only favor people that are purchasing $11 million homes and things like the customer service issues that, that OTAs continue to run into with rentalpreneurs not being able to get any access or get a phone call back. So in a sense, in without having the hosts here, it's the industry talking to itself. I think you said Was that it. rhetorical? You, I think, <laughs> Marjane, I think you said, it, you said it best earlier, right? And, you know, wh what have you felt like this conversation has been? Well, listen, I, you, I'm, I'm a former techie. I, you know, I, I have. It's been very incestuous. And, it's, and listen, it is, it is a conference. It's a short-term rental conference. That's what we're all here to talk about. But I do think it's important to not lose sight of, you know, where the supply is coming from. And it's also important to think through... The policies that we're setting up today, both you know, from a legislative perspective and some of the businesses that you all are building, what is the impact of that five or 10 years out? You know, what is the impact of a generation of forever renters? You know, some of the data we've seen here in New York is that you know, there are people who you know, may not be, you know, may come from abroad, but as soon as a house goes on the market here, the houses are selling at 10 to 20% above asking. Right. They're all cash offers. They're foregoing an inspection. Individual private homeowners cannot compete with corporations in the open market. It's just, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to work that way. And it can't work that way. We can't compete. And look out, look out a generation of people who have not been able to own a home because of the way this marketplace is evolving. Now, I'm not trying to keep anyone from making money, but I do want people to understand the impact of taking all of this inventory on the, off the market, the impact of taking um, 
of, of the prices of homes mm. going up so high that you have to have a side hustle, right. that you have to have something like short-term rental in order to afford it. What's the long-term impact of that? Mm -hmm. How does that exacerbate the wealth gap that we've been trying to close for 60, 70 years? Yeah, right? and this, this isn't just a housing problem, right? right? It's important to, to know that you know every month between 60 and 80,000 people put their first listing up on a major OTA. They become a rentalpreneur, 60 to 80,000 yeah. per month. Yeah. That's more than the combined number of people opening consulting businesses, restaurants, and professional services businesses every month. This is the number one way that people become entrepreneurs today. Yeah, your and, leverage. And, and your, your leverage, your asset that you work to purchase, right? And so limiting access to that is not just limiting access to affordable housing, it's actually limiting access to people being able to build and create wealth for themselves. Right. Um, let's talk about the OTAs a little bit. How do you both think the, uh, the various platforms treat individual hosts, Airbnb, Verbo, and Booking.com? What's, what's your take on that? <laughs> what's, uh, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? I'd love to hear you start first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have experience with all of them. Right. Uh, I certainly have used uh, various platforms when I travel, when I've been able to travel with my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I think from, um, you know, the, for, for me, as someone who only has one unit, the number one um, objective is to get customers. Right. And to right. connect and that I have a vetted customer and that I have someone that I know, you know, is a real person, has a real email address, has a real phone number and that there's some accountability on the other end of that reservation. So from that perspective, I think, you know, as a marketplace, the platforms do really well. You know, my experience is, is you know, specifically with Airbnb, I've you know felt supported when I've had problems, both as a traveler and as a host. Mm -hmm. So I think for the most part, they're, they're doing there are things that they're doing well and doing right. I think they have to keep in mind that most of us are not full-time landlords. Right. Most of us do not want to have to run credit checks and background checks. And to uh, we want to be able to continue to, to empower them and you. Like some of you, I may try your product after this, after listening all day. But, you know, our goal, you know, is to participate in a way that's responsible, but also in a way that does not damage us or jeopardize our own livelihood. So but you don't get the account manager that a, that a larger player will get. Well, no, we don't. I mean, we get like, you know, static reports and a lot of help that <laughs> it takes days and days to read through. But I'm a business person. I, I get that. I think high touch comes with, um, you know, revenue. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you if you want a, a, an account manager, you need to be generating enough revenue to pay that account manager's salary or, or a specific portion of that. So for me, as an individual, my, my expectations are generally met right. uh, in terms of the, the way that those platforms service me. But I will, I forget who said it earlier, but N equals one, I think is a really important thing for people to think about in terms of a homeowner as the customer, N equals one, not N equals, you know, five, five million or, or 35,000, I think was the case. Philip, Mr. is Eden. that your take as well? Do the, do the platforms have your back? So I think, I think that, yeah, at, at scale, the platforms have your back 100%. I think the challenge is that, you know, to the point that you're making, Marginet, the customer isn't the rentalpreneur, it's not the host, it's not the manager, the customer is the consumer. And so, you know, Airbnb, Booking.com, Verbo, and every other OTA, OTA out there, they're going to focus their resources on the part of their supply where they can drive the most bang for the buck and the most revenue. What that means ultimately, though, is that a small sliver of the hosts on those channels actually get any help. Right. If you could put the slide up, I think it'd be really helpful. To yeah, understand. can we get that slide? So what you'll see here, there we go. What we see here is we can, this is a, a chart of the short-term rental industry, specifically Airbnb supply, which is fairly representative. From AirDNA. From, yep. from AirDNA. AirDNA. Shout out to AirDNA. <laughs> is, is broken down by segment. That blue line represents all hosts that have one unit. The green line is one to five units. The orange bar at the top is six to 20, or six to 19. That little pink dot all the way up at the top <laughs> of the orange bar that's 20 plus units. It's not even the 1%, it's the 0.6% of the industry on Airbnb specifically, so it's a little bit more skewed, right? Represents people that have more than 20 properties. So people ask questions, that ask the question frequently, how do we professionalize small hosts? Uh, are small hosts an important part of the industry? Is there a way forward for small hosts? Small hosts are almost the entire short-term rental industry. But, but what percentage of the business are they on Airbnb? 
So we've had some yeah. great data from that. Actually, yeah. you guys presented at the SCIF conference last year, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the same updated chart. But by booking volume, right. people that manage less than 10 units represent about 85% of all supply. So it's right. still very, very close to this chart. It's maybe a Right, but I'm talking about revenue. What percent of the business? This is, is booking volume I'm talking about, yeah. not by number okay. of properties managed. So it's very similar to this chart. Hmm. So, the, so the challenge here is when you're Airbnb, and let's say something in their favor here, right? How do you provide customer service one-on-one -on -one to six million people, six million hosts? It's not possible. And so we end up in a situation with the haves and the have-nots where someone that's at the top of the chart in the pink bar gets to sit down on a quarterly report with their service rep on a channel. And I'm, I'm not being specific to Airbnb. This is the kind of thing that happens at most OTAs. But someone like Marjane or someone like me with one property, I, I can't get the time of day and I can't get an email in response. Now, right. thankfully, I get to sit down with Airbnb every week as a part of my partnership with them in Future Stay, right? It's so I, I should be asking about my property in that right, meeting, right? Right. right. <laughs> but so what we have here is the haves are getting the guidance and the advice. They're learning how to improve their property to make more money. And the have-nots, which rep reflects almost all the short-term rental industries really being left out in the dark. So we have, question, we have conversations about professionalization. Really, we should be talking about how do we provide the resources to the rest of the industry, literally the 99% of the short-term rental industry that isn't given the guidance, that no one is making tools for, that no one is giving a chance to succeed when that, when that is almost the entire industry. Right. I know a lot of hosts uh, do have you know, more issues than what, what you cited. Um, for example, somebody told me, one host told, told us that uh, there was a change in the claims process for uh, an insurance claim on Airbnb. You have, to, um, put, you have to submit it within 48 hours now. It used to be two weeks. Doesn't leave enough time to, to work out the problem with the guests without escalating it. Um, what about those kinds of things? Or getting delisted and you don't really find out why? Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of hosts talking about that. Has, have those things come up for you? They haven't. Um, yeah. the, you know, they haven't come up for me. And again, I am. I, I have one unit. And right. you know, I the, the one thing, the one small adjustment I might offer for people who are super hosts. You know, one of my colleagues is here. I know he's been on Airbnb for you know years, ten years or something, a, a long time. And you know, as a super host, there are you know some perks that you get. But I've never, I've been very fortunate. That's the thing about the, the regulation, back to Local Law 18. I've been very fortunate. I've never had to file a claim. I've never had an issue with, um, with, with, with the a guest. guest. Never. Wow. How many years have you been doing it? 2017. Wow. 2017. And never had an issue never with a guest. Never had an issue with a guest. Oh and we God. are super hosts. We were super hosts. Right. So. But one of the challenges here is that as a small host or a rentalpreneur, it's very common for small hosts and rentalpreneurs to not use any technology. We were talking about that earlier, yes. right? It's estimated that less than 10% less than of rentalpreneurs have any tech stack at all, mm -hmm. right? That's the last thing they want. As I mentioned, they don't want a PMS. They want to figure out how to make more money right. and keep their home. And if you're only listing on one channel or even if you're listing on multiple OTAs and you're not successful on them because you don't know how to optimize, you're not given support from the OTA, you end up with all of your eggs in one basket. So if you do get delisted, your home, yeah, you may, you're your at risk your of losing your home. And so one of the challenges is figuring out how to make sure those small hosts, those millions that we talked about, have access to technology and resources so that they can have a stable business that's not purely dependent on you know, the, the, the whims of a channel or mistaken delisting that could happen. Before we run out of time, let's talk about industry associations. Uh, the Vacation Rental Management Association doesn't represent, you know, they have uh, a small kind of membership for an individual host, which is a recent thing, but they, they represent the property managers. Who represents individual hosts in this industry? But I think one of the challenges that this industry faces, and I think the reason why this, this panel exists today is because, you know, it's important to shed light on the fact that the small hosts are almost the entire industry. They may be locked out of this room largely in rooms like this, although Dennis is doing a great job of bringing us here today. Thanks, Dennis. But more importantly, <laughs> they're starting to form their own organizations. You know, I, I went to uh, the, the STR Wealth Conference in Nashville, put on by Bill Faith and Michael Skogren. There were more people at that conference than they were at the largest VRMA that I've ever attended, and it was the third year. So that segment of the industry they're building their own tools, right? They're building their own influencers. They're going to be making decisions about whether or not they're going to list on Airbnb or Verbo or Furnished Finder, and they're going to be doing it in rooms that you're not a part of. 
And they're not going to feel a need to invite you, just like you didn't invite them to your room. <laughs> Martina, quickly, well, you got to take on this? Quickly, I would say there's Roar. You know, okay. Again, Roar was born out of uh, a reaction to, to Local Law 18. And right. it was very, very organic. It was like, wait, what do you mean we're included? Originally, um, the, the goal was not to go after one and two family homeowners. The goal was to go out after bad actors, people right. who were doing arbitrage, taking hoarding apartments off the market. And so... Um, uh, three very, uh, you know, enterprising women pulled it together and worked very, very hard to establish ROAR, um, collect 550 members. We've met with over 30 members of the city council. We've been very fortunate to meet with the mayor. And, you know, I think that uh, they understand our plight, but they're, they're legislators. They're not moving yet. They're not moving yet. So yeah. we do need people who believe that in economic equity and all the things we've talked about here today, particularly businesses, to let folks know, I'm there's no threat. One right. and two family homeowners do not threaten the hotel, the uh, the hotel industry. It's such a small portion. So, and your voice matters in that. The voice of business, Chase, Amex, uh, Wells Fargo, you know, you're helping people buy new houses on one side of the coin. On the other side, help people keep the homes that they're in. Right. You have that voice. You have that power. Our appeal to you is to help. So... Thank you. My there time you is go. up. So Thank be you. it. Let me get that in. Uh, you two are definitely not bad actors. So there we go. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Great.